Well, <clears throat> no pressure. <laughs> but I'm going to try to make good. First of all, thank you, John, um, for that great introduction. Um, I'm going to try to make good on a couple of things that John talked about, uh, obviously, specifically with respect to motivating why it is that we're trying to do what we're trying to do here, um, and also elaborate, elaborate, offer a sketch um, as to what really fundamentally the point is. You know, um, it's, it's all well and good to say should, right? We have this normative statement, we should do functional programming. Um, okay, that, that ne actually needs justification. It actually needs uh, a reason. And it takes a little bit more than you know, me being this guy, right? Uh, so I'm a, I'm a PSE at Bano. And you know, here I am at the office, basically, right? Asking people to do purely functional programming. Thank you very much, right? That's not especially helpful, you know? It's, to be honest, it's, it's, not, it's not sufficient. It's certainly not sufficient motivation. And if you don't yet know what we mean by functional programming, uh, it's even less helpful, right? So I also say things like this in public on Twitter. Uh, and it's like, you know, oh my gosh, uh, you, you know, little, little aggro there, right? Um, so I try to make up for it by being honest about what the difficulties are in doing functional programming. And, you know, the learning curve is real and, you know, there's this property called referential transparency, but it's really easy to blow, especially in languages that are not Haskell. So, you know, I work in Scala with uh, some of the functional programming libraries. And if you're not referentially transparent anywhere in your call chain, then everything above it is not referentially transparent. Oops. But this also is not especially helpful. You know, it's, it's a whole bunch of, it's, it's going to be slow, you're going to have to spend a lot of time learning, and you're going to get it wrong, right? Yeah, that's, that's just great. And my colleagues know that my idea of a good time is curling up with a paper like this. Um, so this is an excerpt from a paper called A Major Modal Model of Modern General Type Systems, just in case you thought type <laughs> theorists didn't have a sense of humor. And they also know that I think this is a really good book. Can you learn something about type theory from this? Yes, but the words type theory appear nowhere in this book. Heroes like Sam Halliday, Sam, are you out there? Sam's here. Um, heroes like Sam Halliday write titles like this, FP for mere mortals, right, for, for mortals, okay? So this can be very, very intimidating. And if you're trying to do this on the job, your colleagues in your management are probably asking why? You know, why go through the learning curve? Why take the risk if it's so hard to do functional programming in a language like Scala? You know, and by the way, do I need a PhD in mathematics or type theory or category theory or so on? Well, you know, TLDR, no. So let me show you hands-on or recorded hands-on um, what actually this process consists of. So first of all, Let's just look at a quick a function here. This is a normal function as most programmers define the term. It takes an argument, it does some IO, and it has a really crappy MTBF. So in other words, it throws an exception one time out of every three, right? Okay, so, and this is a trivial function obviously. It just tells us whether the argument is even or odd, or it throws an exception one time out of every three. So, okay, uh, we call it on some numbers and it prints out even or odd, or even or odd. We're getting very lucky because it's supposed to throw an exception one time out of every three, right? So um, bear with me uh, until it actually fails, which it should be doing with somewhat higher probability. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but this happens on the job too. You get lucky for a long time, right? And then all of a sudden you get the page, oh, there we go, okay. You get the pager duty at 3 a.m., right? And then all of a sudden something has blown up. Now, one of the important things to understand here is that a function is already a value, right? Every programming language in the world has first class functions, meaning you can assign them to variables and pass them to other functions as arguments and all this kind of stuff. In Scala, we already have this notion, you know, forgive me for now leaping into the mathematical realm, but we have this notion of an algebra on a, on a type. The type here happens to be function one. And my gosh, what am I doing now? Oh, right, I'm defining a new function. So this is an algebra of composition that exists in Scala, um, and then, or compose. So we can actually take a function and treat it as a value, 
and compose it with another function, also treating that as a value, okay, I'm finally getting around to actually defining a function, another function, g. We can compose these functions without running them. I think the key thing to understand about treating functions as values is that you treat them like any other piece of data and you manipulate them with these, in this case, methods, because Scala is also object-oriented in addition to being functional. But you can treat them as values and then manipulate them with an algebra, an algebra of composition in this case, to get a new function that's just another value. But it happens to be a function now that you can also apply to an argument, in this case the unit value, not very interesting. But now what I'm doing is I'm generating a random number and then passing it through my initial function that will either, yeah, will either tell me it's even or odd or blow up. Okay, so important things to understand. A function is a value in almost every modern programming language. It's just another kind of value. It has a type and that type defines operations that you can perform on that value, just like ints, just like doubles, just like anything else, right? Okay, so, so that's a pretty traditional view of a function with a little bit of a twist, that, that we're thinking of the function now as a value of a particular type, okay? Now, yeah, if this works, right, this is about, yeah, function one. This is just making the point. This is the documentation for the and, then, and compose operations that are available on function one in Scala. The only difference between and, then, and compose is which order the functions get called in when they are composed, okay? So that's an algebra, if you will, that's defined on function one. Any function one, you can and, then, or compose. Okay, so let's move on to introducing this horrifying thing called a monad. And what a monad does, and here, I'm, this is gonna be a very informal description, but a monad turns a function that could possibly also have an effect into a value. And you can then manipulate that value just like you can various other kinds of values, but the range of operations that you have available on them is much, much, much larger. So I've got my function one that I've imported. I've done some other imports from Scala Z. I'm using Scala Z here. I'm defining a monadic function. Now I'm taking the integer and I'm, I'm taking my f, my horrible f, and wrapping it in the task monad. So now I have a monadic function that I can call on the argument. And instead of getting it printing even or odd or blowing up, I get another value, which is a task that has this enormous array of things that I can do on a task. And one of the things you can do with a task is run it to actually get the result, right? So unsafe perform sync. The reason it's called unsafe is because it's, it's the point at which you can no longer compose things with it. But that's how you get a result. You get even or odd or it blows up just like before when you actually run it. Sometimes you'll hear functional programmers talk about the end of the world, that's what that means. You should only do the unsafe perform thing that actually runs things at the end of the world. Okay, so we have our monadic function now that when we run it behaves just like the F that we've already seen, right, that we've wrapped. Now it turns out that on, on the task monad, yeah, not on the monadic function, you get to see my work here warts and all, by the way. Um, which is the great thing about working in a REPL. Uh, I, want, I should point that out, actually. I'm a big fan of type and go programming. You know, I, I want to be able to see the results of what I'm doing immediately. So uh, having a REPL in your language is awesome. So if I call the monadic function, there's an operator called attempt on task, and that just gives me any possible exception as a value. Did that happen? Yeah, there's my runtime, runtime error. So now instead of actually throwing an exception and losing control in the program, now I've got it just as another value, just like any other kind of value. So the key thing there is make everything a value. Make your data a value, make your functions a value, make your effects a value, and make your failures a value, okay? Key, 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 key thing to understand in functional programming. So what can we, yeah, another, Another piece of documentation. Here's attempt comes from a comes from a type class called catchable in Scala Z. And there's if you read the near the end of the paragraph there, that first description, it actually tells you this is where we actually start talking about algebras for real, at least in this context, in the sense that 
catchable, one of the promises it makes is it actually catches arbitrary ambient exceptions and it fulfills this guarantee here about what happens, what it means when you compose a function that can possibly catch an exception with another function that doesn't throw exceptions, that's total, a total function doesn't throw exceptions. So that algebraic property is actually very important. It's the key thing about catchable. And there are two things you can do with catchable, which is basically fail on purpose, provide a failure value, or attempt an operation that could potentially fail, and then get that represented as a value. So one time on the job, I was asked to write this, to say, given any monadic function that could possibly fail, we'd like to log any failures that actually do happen. You know, pretty, pretty you know, bread and butter, nuts and bolts kind of thing to want to do. So given our function one, and given a bunch of imports, including the Scala Z imports that we already saw, let, let me recreate my monadic function here, just as, you know, as an example, to stick with the same example. Then the goal is to write a function that can take an arbitrary, any monadic function, and if that function is to fail, log that failure, okay? And, and I, wanted, I want to try to demonstrate this kind of um, declarative style of programming that John was talking about. So given this monadic function, I want to write a function called, uh, what, add logging. And the first argument I want to take is my log function. How do I log? I actually don't care. So I'm just going to say it takes a throwable to unit. It's, it's only done for an effect. How actually logging happens, I neither know nor care. And I'm going to take an arbitrary a to m of b. I don't know what a is. I don't know what b is. I don't know what m is. Those are type variables. I'll have to add those um, in just a minute. So given a log function as an argument and given a monadic function as an argument, um, it needs to be a monadic function. So I need, I need to specify, again, this is Scala. If you don't know Scala and Scala Z, don't worry about it. But I need to know that m is a monad. And I also need to know that m is catchable. Okay, it needs to, to have an instance of this catchable interface that, that lets me say attempt or fail, right? And I'm going to return another a to m of b. I'm gonna return another monadic function that is the same as the one I'm passed, except that it logs any failures when failures happen, okay? So I need to make these type variables. I don't know what a, m, or b are. Okay, think about, think about transforming values. Again, we're transforming values. So what's the simplest transformation of a value you can make? Nothing, right? So at least that compiles. I, now, I know that my signature is not nuts, right? The simplest transformation you can make is the identity transformation. Just don't do anything, return F. But that's, now we want to actually do something meaningful. So we actually take an A as an argument, apply F to it. That's semantically identical to just returning F, right? I could stop there and I would have the same thing. But instead, I want to, I want to get the result of applying F in, in what I'm calling R. And now I want to actually surface any failure that happens with this catchable thing, with attempt on catchable. And, and uh, if you may or may not remember, catchable says, it, you know, its signature says you'll get a throwable or the result, right, as a value. And now what I need to do is I need to reconstruct the result, the final result. I need to fold this failure that I've surfaced back into the result. And it turns out that you can do fold on this or thing that, that, uh, that uh, attempt gives you as its result. And I can fail. Remember, catchable has fail. So I can return the error that way. Um, it's not quite right, right? Um, that's, that's wrong. And it's because um, the bind operation on monad is not flat map, it's bind. OK. So, so now I'm very confident that I've simply reconstructed my monadic function that I was handed in the first place. I haven't actually done anything with the failure except surface it and then unsurface it again. I've unfolded it and then I folded it again. So this is just, it's almost like origami. You know, it's, I'm, I'm taking this thing apart 
and then I'm putting it back together again, and again, the compiler is telling me that I haven't screwed up something trivially, right? I haven't actually, I've made everything line up and make sense. Having surfaced the failure, now I can actually make explicit that I'm taking that as an argument. Now I can actually call my log function and then return that failure, or return that throwable in that function. So I'm gonna log the failure, and that's, that's essentially guaranteed to compile, okay? I mean, a, a key thing, let me pause here for just a second. Let's, let's quickly take a closer look at this. I've, I've asked to surface any failure that can happen in this monadic function with attempt. So I get the throwable as one possible result of this attempt, right? It's in R. Given R, I know it's a monad, I know M is a monad, because it has to be, right? Because the type guarantees that it's a monad. What kind of monad? Is it task? Is it something else? We don't know, we don't care. It's a monad, that's as much as we know. And it's catchable. So I can bind R over folding. Again, there's this sort of V type that, that uh, you can't see right now, but uh, you saw on a previous slide. You can fold that back down into the single value instead of being a throwable or an A you can fold it back down into just the, the monad of A. That's what happens here, and you have, to, you have to bind that to get just the monadic result. The compiler says, good job. And now, you can do the most important thing you can do with any piece of code. Stop thinking about it. This is, this is done. This is done. This will log the failure. How do I know it'll log the failure? Because it can't do anything else. You get a throwable from attempt, and remember, the documentation for catchable says it'll catch anything that's ever thrown, and it composes, uh, it, there's a composition law that it fulfills, end of story. Any, anything that implements catchable works that way. So our A to M of B, where M is a monad that, has, that also happens to be catchable, when I attempt, I'm get, I get a throwable or the result, and when I bind over folding the throwable and the result back into a result, I'm done. It can't do anything else. How many tests do I have to write for this? Zero. There's no point. There is no point to testing this. It can't do anything other than what I just said. Okay, but now I'm going to test it. In the REPL, okay, there's no test suite, there's no, you know, thing that can fail, you know, blah 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 but I like to see the results of my work, you know, I imagine you all do too. So, um, take, the, take the throwable, here's my log function, obviously trivial, take the throwable, print lend the message um, from the throwable, okay. So given our monadic version of this horrible function that fails one times out of three, uh, possibly, return another function that will log when that, another monadic function, that will log when that happens. We got lucky again, it worked, that's an odd number. We got lucky again, we got lucky again, you know, finally, okay. Now, unfortunately, my uh, terminal session recording software that I did this with doesn't capture scrolling back. So you're gonna have to take my word for it that it actually printed out boom. <laughs> Sorry. So now we have, we have this kind of nice little utility, you know, it, it helps in the real world where you're using a monadic function to wrap a non-monadic function and log uh, errors that occur in that monadic function. Any monadic function, doesn't matter which monad, doesn't matter what arguments it takes, doesn't matter what type of value it returns. Okay, any monadic function. And that's a key thing about uh, using uh, generic programming. Uh, we call it, the technical term is parametricity. Um, these laws hold no matter what A, B, or M are, as long as M is a monad and catchable. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's do something a little bit more, more interesting, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more fun. Um, at one point I was asked to uh, given a process, a process is a, is a stream of values generated by some monad. 
Okay, so, and that's called process. So given a process that emits one element and can fail, um, how would you write a function that returns, that transforms that process to another process that retries according to some retry schedule until it either runs out of retry or um, succeeds or fails for the last time? Okay, how do you represent a retry schedule? Well, I mean, first of all, we've got our monadic function again, fine. Uh, this is using Scala Z stream, don't worry about that, the specifics don't matter. But one of the really cool things about functional programming is um, almost everything is an effect, including the passage of time. So you can actually model, here I'm using a, a function called awake every from Scala Z stream. So every one second, it emits the number of nanoseconds that have elapsed since the beginning of the stream, okay? But I don't care about that, so I map it to just unit because I don't actually want those values, I don't care. So just to prove the point, that took five seconds to run. It emitted the number of nanoseconds every second for five seconds, right? But I ignored that. I didn't care about those values. But just to prove that it worked. So now I want to define uh, attempt repeatedly, which given a process of one element and a retry schedule and a log function, this is gonna start off looking exactly like log of failure from a monadic function. So given those things, giving a logging function, a retry schedule, and a process that emits one element, retry that process according to the retry schedule until it succeeds, the retry schedule is, is exhausted, or the, the retry schedule is exhausted with either failure or success. And again, we're gonna return exactly the same thing that we got. We're transforming a value. We're transforming this value P to another process from task to A, and again, we don't know or care what A is. We don't know or care what kind of element is, is emitted by this process. And again, the simplest transformation you can do is nothing, just to confirm that you haven't screwed up the signature somehow. Okay, so our, my first thought is, uh, what's a step? Well, I'm gonna use our good friend attempt again. Attempt on a process, though, is a little different. You have to specify what to do with the throwable Specifically, you have to specify a stream or a process to replace the existing process with. So what I do here is just put in our log and, and uh, eval the, uh, the task of the throwable that it gets. So in other words, if it fails, we just go ahead and fail, but we log the failure. And of course, I can't just return step there because I have this throwable now as part of the return type, right? And we don't want that. So this time I do use flat map because I'm in Scala. I'm not on this, on this uh, type class that, that used bind. It means the same thing. Flat map and bind mean the same thing. So here's the flat map full idiom. Again, process fail or process emit to emit a value. You just say emit. So now I've got the expensive no op, right? It unfolds the thing. Actually, it, go, it logs it, so it's not completely a no op. So this, this will log a failure in P. If, if that happens, okay? So, so this gives me confidence that I haven't broken anything, if you, if you wanna look at it that way. So what does retries mean? Well, this is, this is pretty simple. If you have a sequence, if you have a stream or a list or a vector or whatever, and you want to, to put it one-to-one -one with another stream or vector, vector or list or whatever, that's zip. Most of you are probably already familiar with zip. But it turns out with this stream process where things are taking time, if you zip one stream with another, that stream happens as the other stream emits values, however long that takes. So that, so that gives us retries according to the, the retry schedule. It's very interesting. And then I just map in the end to throw away one of the two elements of the pair that you get when you zip uh, sequences together. So that means that in order to actually do anything, I need to, I need to say step append retries in order to get as many retries as we want. But then I have too many elements, right? I only want one, P only emits one. So I want the last element of this stream appended to that stream, right? But it's still not quite right, right? Because I haven't said anything about stopping when any of these attempts is successful. So it turns out that I can append another stream 
to p, and it turns out I can kill the retry schedule. That's a perfectly good, that's a perfectly good stream. Okay, that sounds really weird, believe me, I know. It's also important to note that there are two ways a stream can terminate, normally and abnormally, and append only works if the, if the stream being appended to terminates normally. So I'm gonna pause again. Now let's, let's think about cases here, because this, this is a little subtle. So a step is an attempt that, if successful, kills the retry schedule. And if unsuccessful, logs the failure, okay? I love that. It took, it took a little bit of thinking, even when I wrote this for the first time several years ago, um, it took a little bit of thinking to get there. I love it because it's crisp, it's concise, and it's exhaustive. I have now completely described step, completely, exhaustively. Step is an attempt of P that, if successful, kills the retry schedule, if unsuccessful, logs the failure, period. End of story, okay? Retries is just steps repeated in lockstep with the retry schedule. I don't know how that could be any, any simpler. Step plus retries, okay, try once and then keep trying over and over and over again according to the retry schedule, but the retry schedule can be killed by any successful step, either the first one or any of the ones in retries. So, okay, this, so this requires a little bit of thought. So, for example, what happens if the retry schedule is empty? Right? Well, if the retry schedule is empty, then step append retries reduces to step, so a stream of one element. Taking the last element of a stream of one element gives you that element, and then you fold any failure or success back into the result, and you're done. What happens if the first step is unsuccessful, retries is not empty, let's, let's say retries has two elements. Okay, so the first step fails, doesn't kill the retry schedule, retries continues um, repeating steps until one of those steps is successful, or none of them are. In any case, step append retries has one or more elements, in this case it has more than one element. We get the last one, the last element will either be the first and only success or the last failure. What happens if the retry schedule is infinite, which it can be, by the way? Well, if retries is infinite, then step append retries will also, uh, um, retries will also be infinite, step append retries will also be infinite, and it'll just keep retrying forever and ever and ever and ever and ever until and unless any of those steps is successful, which kills the retry schedule, and then it emits that one last successful value, okay? How many tests do I have to write? Zero. Zero. I have exhaustively described what this code does without running it. The name of the game in typed functional programming is to be able to write code like this and to write it this way. What, you know, what I've done twice now is I've run through a series of transformations of values. What's a value? A value, right? A string, an int, a double, you know, whatever. What's another value? An effect, like printing anything to the console. What's another value? Catching an exception. All of those are values because I've made sure to make them values. And so I have this code that manipulates values. I've told you what each and every one of these whopping three lines does. And when I've described it, I have described it exhaustively. There is nothing else this code can do. Now let's test it. Or just admire its beauty for a few more seconds. <laughs> And I am very proud of this code, by the way. I, you know, I wrote this for a system at Verizon Labs called Funnel, uh, distributed monitoring system. Um, okay, so attempt repeatedly wants our log function, simple log function. So again, get the message from the throwable, printlin, all that good stuff. 
And our retry schedule I already defined uh, earlier just to show what that can look like. And now a, a process made from our monadic function. So that's just a val. You can eval um, a monadic, monadic function. Or you can eval, uh, you can eval the, the monad, actually. OK. So now I've transformed a simple process eval. So that's a stream of one element to one that will retry according to that schedule until it either succeeds or retries X number of times up to five times and fails. So we're getting, again, we're getting very lucky, like you always do until you get that three o'clock in the morning call. Oh, there we failed, and then find it retried and then succeeded and set odd. So let's keep doing this a few more times because that was not interesting enough. And it keeps working, keeps working, keeps working the first time. Oh, didn't work, oh, didn't work, oh, didn't work, oh, didn't work, and then finally, success. So that is attempt repeatedly. I've, I've taken this horrible function that fails one time out of every three. It does IO. You know, it has, it has side effects. It fails. Real world, right? Very real world. And in three lines of code, I've managed to make something that retries according to some arbitrary f fallback schedule. It could be, you know, exponential fallback. You know, it could be much more sophisticated than the one I actually wrote. It retries according to that schedule until it either runs out of retries or succeeds. That's a super useful thing that I did in three lines of, of functional programming in Scala. Okay, so let's make this even even more real world. But this is going to be a little bit more of a thought experiment. So I import my imports. So I've got a bunch of Scala Z related stuff, including HTTP for us and HTTP framework uh, written around uh, functional programming in Scala. These days it's in cats. I'm using uh, the Scala Z version still. So I'm going to define this example type with a few fields just as an example. I want to be able to accept this as JSON. Uh, so I need a JSON decoder um, for it. So I'm going to define one of those in one line. Basically looks like that. And now I want to define a web service. Simple. Simple web service, which in HTTP for us is called HTTP, HTTP service. HTTP service is a monadic function from a request to a task of response. So, um, so there's your monadic function. And I want to accept a post at API example. And what I want to do with that request is I want to transform it to my example case class, my example type, nice structured type. And then I'm just going to turn around and return it right back. So this is the world's lamest echo service, right? It's so lame that it only takes one thing, JSON with this structure, and then immediately turns around and, re and returns it. Now, and I'm already done, okay? This is a very simple, trivial, contrived, HTTP service, but it is complete in, in an important sense. So think about what I haven't done in this service, right? Think about the fact that I haven't said a single solitary thing about failure. But there are a number of ways this can fail, right? The path can be different. The client could something, send something other than a post. They could send something th with, the, they could send a request whose uh, content type is not application JSON. They could send a request whose content type is application JSON, but could, they could send garbage. They could send gobbledygook that wouldn't even parse as JSON. They could send well-formed JSON that doesn't have the right structure to transform to this example type, right? All of those things are possible. And this service, which basically codes the happy path, right? It, it says, OK, I want to return an OK response given that I get an example, and I'm going to transform that right back to JSON and send it back. But if the path doesn't match, the response will be a 404. If there's a problem with uh, parsing the JSON, the response will be, a, I forget, but you know, 422 or something like that. Um, if uh, if the, the method doesn't match, I forget what HTTP status is that, but that's what will get sent back. So in other words, 
by using the same techniques that I used in the previous couple of examples, we now get to just think about the way that the service works as it's supposed to work when it succeeds. And the failures work the way they're supposed to too. And if you wanted to drill down on the details on that, you certainly can. You can read the HTTP for us documentation, you can look at the source code, convince yourself that everything that I just said is true, that you don't have to worry about this anymore. Now, once again, we get to do the most important thing you can do with any piece of code, which is what? Stop thinking about it. Go home, pet the cat. Watch House with your wife. You'll never stop, by the way, you know, eight seasons, I think it was. Stop thinking about it, okay? You, you can exhaustively understand what this code does without running it. So, in summary, that's, that's basically it. Every, make everything a value. Values are values, effects are values, failures are values. You, manip manip bleh. you manipulate them algebraically. I'm tripping over myself here. Um, you manipulate them algebraically according to, yeah, there are laws. Have I mentioned a single solitary thing about the monad laws? You know, have I said anything at all about functors and applicatives and, you know, monoids and semigroups and all that kind of stuff? I did say something about monads, but I didn't talk about the monad laws. I didn't have to, you know. I just manipulated values in a consistent way. And mostly I just hit enter to let the compiler tell me whether I was manipulating them in a consistent way or not, right? So that's the name of the game. Oh, and in languages that aren't necessarily purely functional like Scala, avoid escape hatches, right? It takes some discipline to avoid doing non functional things um, in not necessarily purely functional languages. So, you know, you do have to put in some, some effort there. Okay, um, this is a blog post from the Reason ML folks, and I particularly want to call attention to the second bullet point here. They rewrote, as of the time of this posting, half of Facebook Messenger in Reason ML versus, I guess, JavaScript. And they went from multiple issue reports per week to 10 issue reports in a year, okay? That's not an improvement of a factor of two. That's not an order of magnitude improvement. That's two orders of magnitude improvement, right? Go home, <laughs> pet the cat, hang out with your significant other, okay? Why do functional programming? So you can lower your blood pressure, okay? <laughs> So you can sleep at night. So you can have a hobby, okay? So you can have a life. Nobody needs the stress of, oh my gosh, we did a Friday deployment, okay? You, you know what? I love Friday deployments, why? Because I know what my code is going to do before it runs. As a developer, that's why to do functional programming. As a business, the reason to do functional programming is because with this kind of reduction in defect rates, it's money in the bank, friends. That's it. If any of this is still mysterious, and it probably is, if any of this is baffling, confusing, even with my little contrived examples, you're in exactly the right place. Welcome to LambdaConf, everybody.